so they arrested us. Uh, there was a trial. I got 12 years, sentenced to 12 years in prison. At that stage, we decided that we're not going to accept our sentences, we're going to escape. I grew up as the normal, uh, normal white South African, which means that I wasn't involved in politics or didn't have any political ideas at all. Uh, I just accepted uh, the status quo. Black people lived there, white people lived here, and everything was fine because that's the way God ordered it to be, you know. So um, <clears throat> it's only when I, I actually left South Africa that I found out about my own country and I discovered what apartheid was and, and then I made an effort to find out and the more I found out, the more shocked I was about the reality of the country and what it was doing to the majority of the population. You know, I grew up in the 60s. Uh, Mandela was some kind of figure that I remember registered in my brain, but, you know, he wasn't any kind of hero for me because I was a white person and he was some terrorist who was doing something there, you know. <laughs> so he probably deserved to be in prison. I got involved in um, student politics at university and then I teamed up with another guy and then we left the country again to try and find out more about the liberation movement because, again, that was banned in South, South Africa. And as a banned organisation, there was nowhere you could go, there was no one we could contact, it was too dangerous. The one organisation that impressed us the most was the African National Congress. It seemed to be the one that really was doing something. It was setting up camps, it was trying to get people back into the country. They had quite a large presence in the UK and they trained us um, and that training involved they were going to send us back as uh, essentially information officers or publicists to keep alive the, the notion that the ANC was there and the struggle was continuing, that the regime hadn't crushed the ANC. They taught us various unique methods of distributing this literature and this included things that are called uh, leaflet bombs, which were just small explosive devices that threw the leaflets up into the air. You might think, why go to all this trouble just to distribute leaflets, you know? Today, people just stand at the traffic lights and shove it through your window. But we obviously couldn't do that. So you had to use these um, techniques where there's no person involved. I mean, no person actually just handing out stuff. So you had to place your device, make sure it had enough time for you to get away. There would be a loud bang and these things would explode into the air. The leaflet it itself was almost secondary. So you'd have a loud bang, there'd be a leaflet, people would run and pick them up. Uh, you couldn't say very much on a little leaflet like that. It would just be inspirational stuff, you know. But that was really unimportant almost. It was just the event. So there would be this loud bang in the middle of the street, people running, and then police cars coming and trying to confiscate all these leaflets. And then it would be reported in the daily newspaper, headlines. So really the newspapers were doing our work for us. It would have been better from their side if they had just not reported these things at all. But they had to report them because thousands of people would have witnessed it. The way they presented it, obviously, it's like, uh, a loud bang, they wouldn't say, give any credence to the ANC, they would just say, terrorists strike again, you know, or something like that. Or terrorists plant bombs in the street, and make it sound dreadful. But I think the majority of the people who it was aimed at, in other words, the, those oppressed by apartheid, would understand that, you know, terrorist means freedom fighter to them. We don't know for sure exactly how we got caught um, um, I believe it was just careful police work over a long period of time. We were active for two and a half years and at the time when we were overseas visiting the ANC we were very naive, we didn't really understand how these things work and it's possible that the security police at that stage would have opened a file on us and that's how they work, you know, if they see someone doing something or in a situation like at a political meeting or getting involved in student politics they would open a dossier on you later on you visit another meeting they write it down 
and then maybe there's a protest meeting somewhere else and there's a guy taking a photograph and then the photograph goes into the folder and within time the folder gets quite big and fat and um, that still doesn't mean you, you're an activist or they've got anything on you but they just collect information like that. When you're active, say in a particular city, they would take a map and pinpoint where all these actions are taking place. So the kind of assumption you could make is that if there's a round ball like this with leaflet bombs going and other things happening in this area, that the person or the people doing it must probably live in, in that kind of area. And that could lead them to notice that you're doing something strange, you're buying lots of paper or envelopes or you go out late at night to do strange things and um, that's how they get onto you. So they arrested us, uh, there was a trial, I got 12 years, sentenced to 12 years in prison. At that stage we decided that we're not going to accept our sentences, we're going to escape. Ours was a very special prison, it was, um, uh, it was a political prison, so everyone there was on our side. So they were all ANC people, they were all males, they were all white because that was apartheid, you had separate prisons for everybody. And so they were all on our side so we can talk about it openly and they even assisted us to, to escape. That arrest might never have taken place if we had had decent communication, which we didn't at that time because our handlers were basically in the UK, in London and we were in South Africa. And these were the years before computer communications. So the only electronic means we had was really the telephone. And even then, you couldn't really talk. And we had various operational keywords. But we couldn't just phone someone in London and say, help, these guys are after us, what do we do? We couldn't do that, it was too dangerous. Operation Vula was, happened at a time when the technologies became available. In the mid to late 80s, the first computers were, uh, uh, became available. There was still no internet, so we had to kind of invent our own internet. Uh, a, a network of connected com computers between South Africa, London, and then back down to Zambia again. It was in operation for just two years. So two years before the end of apartheid, this thing was effective. And we achieved in those two years more than the previous 20 years, simply because we didn't have proper communications. At that time, you see, 1989, we knew that the apartheid regime was on its last legs, and they hadn't given up yet, but so they were talking to Mandela in prison. They said, we can release you, but we have to discuss the terms of your release. They didn't want this kind of great, enormous figure to come out and then stir up a revolution. They wanted to release him very gently and said, you know, you can come out, but you, you mustn't do too much. What they didn't realize was that Mandela was communicating with the leadership in the ANC. So by negotiating with Mandela, they thought they were creating a split in the ANC. So Mandela just stood his ground because he was communicating with the leadership. So what Mandela was communicating to the government was not his personal point of view but he was talking ANC politics you know. and they didn't realize that so <laughs> when he was released there was no difference between Mandela and the ANC outside so, and we all know what happened after that. After the ANC came to power in 94 I became disillusioned in a way because I realized that the political struggle which we'd won was not really the real struggle. It's like only part of it and it's actually the lesser part of it. It's the economic struggle that is really the more important one. And to talk about overcoming or changing the economic paradigm is very difficult because South Africa, like every other country in the world, is now part of a kind of globalized economy. So how do you change that? You know, it's one thing changing the po political situation in South Africa, but how do you change the ownership of the big corporations, which are multinational corporations? The community exchange system is 
an attempt to provide an exchange system where people can exchange what they do and what they can give with each other, which is exactly what money does, but money is controlled by an elite who control the supply of money and how it's issued into society. But you can do the same thing through other means. And the exchange system tends, tries to do that. So you don't require banks, you don't require interest, you don't require a physical currency. In fact, there is no currency as we understand it. So there's no quantity of money. There is no one in control of the system. All it does really is it measures the transfer of value. You can use time to measure that, or you can use any metric you like, really. Uh, you're measuring value. So the currency itself is a bit more like a, a bit more like a kilogram or a you know centimeter, which are units of measure. Most of us money in our minds exists. We think of it as coins and notes, and if we take it to the bank, they convert it into numbers. But we can see those numbers on an ATM. But in our minds, ultimately, it represents something tangible. Now, I've got 500 credits because I've already done something. I've given you a bicycle. So now that represents my claim on what the rest of society provides. So I can go to the next person and they're selling some vegetables and I can get vegetables. And now I'm down to zero again because I got vegetables to the value of the bicycle. Or more, I can go into the minus. And so it's all just a question of numbers going up and down. Because I've given you a bicycle doesn't mean you have to come and do something for me. It's not a barter arrangement. You don't have to come and polish my shoes or mow my lawn or something. You are now obligated, you are minus 500, you are obligated to the value of minus 500 to give something back to the community for 500 or more. So you can then sell something or do something for someone else. It's essentially what money does as well. Apartheid wouldn't have been able to survive something like the internet because it could only work if people didn't know what was happening by keeping people totally ignorant. And the internet came at a time like a few years after apartheid collapsed and it was the same thing with the Eastern Bloc here in Germany. The wall fell at exactly that same time and the whole of the communist world collapsed all at the same time. And it was when all these kind of information technologies were becoming available, people were beginning to find out, and it couldn't have survived. And the one thing that they would never prevent, uh, allow in South Africa, was information about what was happening in the country. Our motivation to, was to raise a public debate whether the our secret services are behaving in an unconstitutional way or not.